Okay. Okay. Good evening, friends. This is Dr. Rajkumar from Baroda. On behalf of IPS Vadodara, I welcome you all on the brain on Wednesdays, the fourth session in the line of CME series that we wish to have. And the topic for the day is positive symptoms reanalyzed based on neuroscience, neuroanatomy, connectonomics, and neurogenetics. And speaker is none other than Dr. Bhaskar Mukherjee. I don't think he needs any introduction. Without an ado, I give Bhaskar the platform. Dr. Bhaskar, take over. Hello, everyone. Today, this would be a six or eight series on the first lecture of this six or eight series topic of psychosis, mania. They are neuroscience, they are neuroscientific treatment, and finally, we would be doing two or three case-based discussion topic on how to treat a given case of psychosis or chronic psychosis, chronic mania or so-called bipolar, and along with that, what to do, what not to do. So we are looking at a six to eight topic series within Brain on Wednesday itself. It was inaugurated by Dr. Nojikata Desai. He has given the outlook and comprehensive outlook of the basic science of psychosis and mania. It was done for the PGs so that PGs can have some basic idea that are missing in current textbooks and current teaching. Today onwards, it would not only be PGs, it would be PGs, post PGs, and anyone interested in learning how brain works, how brain causes so-called delusion, so-called hallucination, so-called mania, and so on, and what we can do to manage these symptoms of brain dysfunction. This would be as much as a basic neuroscience topic as, as much as it is clinical neuroscience and translational neuroscience topic. I would go on elaborating the neuroscience behind this phenomenology, what we can understand from it and how we can translate it to new treatment. And I hope with this series, within the Brain on Wednesday CME series, you would understand that there is no real treatment resistance in psychiatry. So without much wasting time, let's go to the topic proper. This is the first part on positive symptom. I would try to cover the basic neuroscience, neurobiological explanation and deconstruction of positive symptoms today. And if time permits, I would try to elaborate the treatment today. But if the time is not that much, then we would elaborate the treatment on next date. That is two weeks after today. Let me share my screen. I would request everyone, if you ever 
miss the voice or the slide please inform either in chat box or directly speak up because unfortunately when i i am talking by seeing towards a screen i am not able to understand what audiences are listening or not so this would be my humble request to all please come up with your responses if you cannot hear anything with that let's start with this topic some of you have heard part of this topic in about one year before when i started part of this series in thursday musing but due to a lot of problems that series was cancelled so molecular psychopharmacology from pathophysiology to clinical application about psychosis psychosis actually is the last frontier of the puzzle named brain once we understand and figure major psychosis we would be able to solve brain and we would be able to work on the part of immortality that the brain community is almost able to replace every organ brain cannot be replaced but brain can be repaired and the repair starts from understanding psychosis so what is psychosis actually in theoretical physics they say when it when you can define a problem you are halfway towards solving the problem so what would be the definition of psychosis in our part of biology there are thousands of pathophysiological as well as psychological explanations of psychosis and multiple stringent cross sectionary imaginary criterion system but no real scientific brain based pathophysiological definition the same or icd or chinese or russian criteria all are based on jumbled cross section phenomenologies and no real world data and observations match with them it is the most frustrating thing of brain science we do not really practice what we preach so for the purpose of this discussion series psychosis would be defined as a pervasive continuing brain dysfunction syndrome that is characterized by intermittent or continuous presence of various symptoms related to every brain so you have intermittent or continuous hyperactivity of brain excitation processes and associated neuroendocrine and immune system dysfunction psychosis would have emotional symptom cognitive symptom somatic symptom sensory or perceptual symptom motor symptom and behavioral symptom some symptoms would be prominent some symptoms would not be so much noticeable unless deeply examined in every patient but the dysfunction would be characterized by dysfunction in each symptom domain so for this would be our definition according to which we would try to demystify various phenomenology as so now you have some confusion about somatic symptoms you have not heard about somatic symptoms of psychosis but if you ask patients of chronic psychosis you would find all of them or majority of them would complains dysfunction of various organ system that would be the somatic symptom again 
sensory or perceptual symptom i am not explaining here because that would be the most discussion on psychosis in next slides the padda motor symptoms would again needs to be in known because we talk about motor but every psychosis is associated with problems in visuo motor functioning problem in functioning of various fine motor tasks and various problem associated with treatment which many a time attributed to medication for example akathisia is a very common motor symptom that we attribute to drugs only but it is as much as a symptom of psychosis as it is a symptom of drug induced motor dysfunction of psychosis similarly tardive dyskinesia and tardive movement disorders they are also genetically predisposed in patients of psychosis so these are the motor symptoms we will be talking about later so historically this would be actually re emergence and reinvention of unitary psychosis and major psychosis modified by cognitive molecular systemic and connection connection neuroscience so we are now going to the positive symptom proper and their brain based dissection from phenotype to genotype filling one layer after another i would be talking about connectomics too but the connectomics would be shown in a different slide and from real pictures what are the positive symptoms delusions hallucinations these are the more main positive symptoms that we worry about some might say anger irritability impulsive behavior this can also be included into positive symptom because by its definition positive symptoms means presence of those symptoms which should not be there but these are not the all positive symptoms that every first year is grill into every first year trainee in psychiatry the positive symptoms are various forms of delusions and hallucinations and they are grilled into standard and fast track symptom unfortunately all of would all of which would be ultimately classified into illusion and hallucination so let's first come to delusion the phenotype to connectomics of delusion what is delusion actual and this delusion has nothing to do with current internet slang delusion so again when we talk about delusion we must first come to a definition of delusion until we come to a definition we cannot dissect so there is a definition of delusion the definition is fixed firm belief that is non amenable to any logical reasoning to the contrary and not in accordance to the prevailing socio cultural norms but there comes a question why should there be definition that there is there be a definition that would include prevailing so, uh, socio cultural norm because we are defining a biological phenomena we are defining a biomedical phenomena 
if we are defining a biomedical phenomena prevailing socio cultural norms should not be a part of it we are not enforcers of societal boundaries and societal justice and we are not the ones who are deciding who is maintaining social standard and who is not maintaining social standard right that is not job of psychiatrist unfortunately we mostly do that but that is not the job of a biomedical professional we are not there for social enforcing so it is better to drop the socio cultural norms because socio cultural norms only add various problematic confusion here for example the so called socio cultural phenomena then they would be included into various forms of delusion like mass hysteria like coro like various other thing but they are not really delusions right a group of people believed them believed them based on their anxiety and we mostly treat the anxiety to treat this socio cultural phenomena so it is better to drop the socio cultural norms from definition of delusion so what is delusion again a fixed firm belief that is not amenable to logical reasoning to the point if we de do include this definition of delusion then comes whether it is a normative trait or not it is a normative trait every animal has a preference in everything it does and feel every animal has a favorite food a favorite place to roam a favorite weather meet or not meet and a favorite color favorite things so it is a integral part of self we define our self by our cognitive bias towards something and our cognitive bias against something if i see i am a person then i am saying i am a person who is liking this 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 who is disliking this 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 and this is going to change or not change in the future but this is what i am in all non human being this is the same thing and when the preference of habitats like choices and internal confrontational and fight flight or freeze response ensures remember avatar the james cameron film that is nothing but the way of navi classing with the way of humans and that is just class of preferences every socio cultural phenomena every historical phenomena every phenomena that we love to say is part of sentience and sentient being are actually part of our preferences so we can see that each one of us in this lecture ecological system or universe has some self determined cognitive bias 
also known as preferences, and we would resist challenging them. And that means the so-called delusions are actually extreme expression of a normatively distributed physiological cognitive state of life. We even have a few names for it, choice, perspective, and at its core, it is adding personal balances or personal values to a decision option. So what are the extreme but normative physiological state of choice and balance expressions in human being? We would go into true pathology, obviously, but first let's go to quasi pathology. That is extreme physiological expression of this physiological phenomena, which are socially and culturally accepted, yet are as pathological as are the so-called delusion or true pathological expression. Fanaticism of all kinds, political fanaticism in India of today, I hope I don't have to talk about political fanaticism or social fanaticism or religious fanaticism. But there are also but there are also humanitarian fanaticism. Humanitarian fanaticism means let's not go too far. Medha Patakar is one of the examples of humanitarian fanaticism. Altruistic fanaticism. You can say that how can altruism where I am leaving my own self behind is a fanaticism. There are many examples throughout the world where by exercising their altruistic choice, people have harmed others, people have harmed themselves and killed themselves. The self immolation of Buddhist monks in protest in, let's say, Myanmar, the self-immolation during Mondal Commission, then suicide bombing, it is a kind of altruistic, obviously uh, altruistic fantasism. Similarly, you would actually be very mad at me if I give this example. But all the war heroes who got Paramvir Chakra posthumously, they also showed altruistic fantasism. So every kind of human choices can be fantasized. And that fantasism is acceptable and sometimes noble, many a times noble for society, but that is one example of almost pathological expression of this ex choice. And then our favorite behavioral addiction and process addiction or process overuse. We love to stamp everything. Someday I am hoping psychiatrists would stamp leaving a kind of addiction. I'm hoping for that. Someday living would be a kind of addiction for psychiatrists. But anyway, all these so-called behavioral and process overuse are actually normative physiological expression of choice and valence. And it is extreme overuse. We just 
accept political fanaticism we just accept social fanaticism we just accept religious fanaticism but when a human being individually does some kind of fanaticism which is not accepted by majority of society it becomes a behavioral and process addiction for that unfortunate minority they are doing as much a physiological thing at as the other kind of fanaticism so this makes this behavioral trait basis of a lot of human achievement including civilization founding technological advancement to a lot of human suffering because let's say every scientist who is working and toiling to advance human civilization and has done something for human civilization advancement is and was and always will be a fanatic and obviously i don't need to talk about human sufferings the suffering would involve every social economic and political damage ever been inflicted by this inflicted in this planet by humanity everything is just fanaticism and everything is just this physiological state of choice and balance expressed in extreme so if this is the physiology then what would be the pathology look like so for that we need to understand the role of choice and value in our decision making process this we need to understand again and again so under to understand how this wrong physiological process can give rise to pathological expression of delusion for every human behavior or animal behavior there is a situational response and the situational response is represented by some problem and how to overcome the problem that starts with representation of and the representation is nothing but what are the sorts of physical uh, phys physical action that can be done to avoid or overcome the situation how many of these actions are actually induced induction of some internal states and how many of these action are induction of some external state and how is the condition of internal state to continue the action as well as how is the external state to allow the physical action let's say i am sitting here talking with you if i feel hungry what would be the internal state of mind i am i am feeling hungry but i cannot go and take food at this moment because i have to talk with you so my internal state would be assessing how much hunger i can suppress and the external state is determined by i am sitting here so the set of physical action would be to letting go of the hunger to suppress the hunger or to forget the hunger or to pause this webinar and order something for my hunger now the valuation part for valuation in my given example i have to attach emotional value as well as practical value to this action if i suppress my hunger then what would be the emotional value of that action what would be the practical value of that action the practical But value is the yes basker Hello. can i just ask you to drag the right lower video which is there in your screen to the right you are the only one who will be able to do that because that blocks the completely ha yes fine yes. thank you okay. 
ओके सो सप्रेसिंग द हैंगर एज अ फिजियोलॉजिकल कॉन्सिक्वेंस फॉर मी बट इट वुड लिट द webinar go on and if i pause the webinar and set my hunger then that would cause the webinar to stop and that would have a emotional value for me and ultimately based on that i would select my action for me the webinar is more important because i am trying to solve one of the key dilemmas in my subject psychosis so i would gladly let the hunger go and i would stick to webinar that action i selected because of my persistent disappointment with current state of my subject and my elation at the perspective of solving some of the problem so you see emotions give the actions values my pre my present emotions my past emotional reaction my past emotional memory my past memory of similar action all of this becomes importance for valuation then there will be outcome evaluation once i have chosen the a continuation of webinar how i am feeling how the future events are going this would be remembered and stored in my brain and in future in similar kind of situation i would draw upon this learning to choose a similar sort of or dissimilar sort of action depending on other thing this is the learning that dictate everything so this is a very simplistic approach to categorize this process to different brain region this is very simplistic because this was actually idea of 2008 9 10 when i was studying human brain value control this is not at all important at this moment now because at this moment we know things are much more different and much more complex than this simplicity so do not remember this but just for some simplistic understanding see the value judgment is done by orbit pattern cortex in previous understanding so there is a punishment anticipation that is one value reward anticipation another value don't try to remember the names of the area because the names has no meaning at this stage this was true for 2010 this is not true for 2024 then there would be approach action or avoidance action then there would be outcome evaluation then the outcome evaluation has already some preprint idea in our brain and the outcome would be matched with those preprint idea or preprint reward if the reward is more than the pre planned outcome then it would be positive reward prediction error if the reward is less than pre planned outcome then it is negative reward prediction error and based on this there will be cost estimation there will be value computation computation and ultimately the action selection would be again repeated and this is all part of cognitive control why i am saying that don't try to remember the areas because it has become much 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 complex now so this is why brain doesn't allow for this simplicity and so 
do not remember these areas. So what brain areas and brain network give us the choice and values? The network of self means autobiographical memory, autobiographical learning, and autobiographical reasoning. Yesterday, someone asked me that what is the network of self? I didn't answer because I wanted to answer today. So need self, our self is not whole brain that decides our self. It is a, some part of brain in conjunction with other parts, areas of brain, which determines self. And this whole connection are networks of self. Then there are networks of learning as a whole. Then network of memory formation as well as network of recall. Then networks of executive function secondary to other and networks of attention and vigilance secondary to others. First, network of self, network of learning and network of memory formation are the major. Then executive function and attention and vigilance comes secondary to this. So what is autobiographical memory? Autobiographical memory is self description. Then emotion. Then specific event and general event which connect to life history and all these come together to form the autobiographical memory through which we define us or the unique I. I am Bhaskar Mukherjee because I have some form of self description that has been developed over the year within my brain. Then there are some emotions that I associate with myself. Then there is life history, which is specific, some specific event as well as general event, which I associate with myself. And all together, this create the core autobiographical memory of me as myself. Now, there would be autobiographical memory river because memory storing and memory retrieval, these two are two different things and they are not the same. Unfortunately, because of vastness of this area, I would be giving some ideas, some general ideas, but it is not possible for me to take every name of everything that is related with memory storing and memory retrieval. So with this caveat, let's go into what kind of memory retrievals are there. One is perceptual remembering, and the other one is conceptual remembering. These are two ways of memory retrieval. Conceptual remembering means formed, forming integrated or holistic representation of personal events. Serves decision making in novel or ambiguous scenario. That must be grounded in an evaluative context. Means here I have to take help of multiple personal events and based on that I have to form a point of view and this point of view or this interpretation would help me 
make a decision where there is no easy way to choose wrong or right, where I have to use percentage logic or fuzzy logic to determine how much our decision is good for me or bad for me. And based on that, I have to do the conceptual remembering. So here, the uh, form, these brain areas, which are green highlighted are more important. They are dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, which causes self-processing and schema processing. Then reward and value processing are done by lateral orbital frontal cortex as well as ventral striatum. Then there is emotional based, emotion based evaluation, which is done by amygdala. Then there is knowledge based processing, which is done by anterior or lateral temporal cortex and perineal cortex. Then there would be perceptual remembering. Here we would be remembering as experience representation of individual personal event, not flavor of all personal events. And it starts decision making in well-structured scenario that are grounded in an external External context means, let's say, we have to take some decision that has happened before in our external environment, and we were intimately associated with those processes in past. And based on those past experiences, we can take a decision on that. This involves the blue areas which are highlighted. Sensory matter and spatial processing process would be there, which would be done by somatosensory cortex and anterior precordius. Multimodal sensory integration, which would be done by inferior parietal lobule. Then there would be Contextual processing, which would be done by parahippocampal cortex, retrospinal cortex, and there will be visual processing, which would be done by orbital, sorry, uh, uh, occipital cortex. As there was continuous evaluation, uh, evolution of the network of cells. In 2000 to 2010, when I was working here, mostly as a student and early minted professional, there was this type of understanding of network of cells. Orbitofrontal, dorsomedial prefrontal cortex, as well as anterior cingulate, posterior cingulate, and along with that, orbitomedial prefrontal cortex. They used to be part of the self-referential stimuli in cortical midline structure. Orbitomedial prefrontal cortex used to represent Dorsomedial prefrontal cortex used to evaluate, anterior cingulate used to monitor, and posterior cingulate used to integrate. And along with that, these areas also cause, uh, cause representation, monitoring, evaluation, integration, self awareness, unity, agency, spatial perspectivity, ownership, mind reading, or rather 
trying to understand mimicking of others mental state autobiographical memory emotion and things like that but when i have described a network of autobiographical memory you have understood that we have processed and we have went much ahead from 2000 to 2010 state to today current time it is three level model of self which goes from internal to external in the form of interoceptive processing which represents internal sensory signal of cardio respiratory gastrointestinal and urogenital function it is the prerequisite of integration of internal and external environment signal into the self then come extraceptive processing part extraceptive processing is representation of extraceptive and proprioceptive signals directly related to one's own body the immediate the immediate part of body and it is the intermediate level that links the internal body and external environment then the mental self processing is the representation of self related non bodily signal such as for us what is our personality trait for us what is our other attributes that we think that causes finalization of environment information to self information and create the final image of ours and this has developed around 2020 and we are slowly progressing in this understanding the neuro imaging correlate would be the in a the neuro imaging correlate is c in these pictures right insula left insula thalamus dorsal anterior cingulate cortex and para hippocampus they mostly give us idea about interoceptive process then right inferior frontal gyrus left insula right insula anterior medial prefrontal cortex right prefrontal medial cortex uh, sorry right parietomedial cortex and right premotor cortex right temporoparietal junction left temporoparietal junction they give us idea about extraceptive processing because they are related with proprioception and they are related with our immediate understanding of our body in three dimensional spaces then mental self processing is regional anterior cingulate cortex anterior medial prefrontal cortex right insula left insula thalamus posterior cingulate cortex right temporoparietal junction left ventral temporal junction so you see there are a lot of overlap in this three sense of self but ultimately if we combine all these areas those combined areas would represent our complete network of self the sound finding from all different neuroimaging trials has shown that mental self processing would involve in insula temporoparietal junction anterior medial prefrontal cortex premotor cortex regional anterior cingulate cortex and posterior cingulate cortex extraceptive processing would be done by insula temporoparietal junction anterior medial prefrontal cortex
and premotor cortex. Interceptive processing is mostly insula and insula itself. These are the comparison in 20 years, what we reached in 20 years. Starting from cortical midline structures, now we have ended in a complicated brain-wide network which connects insula, temporoparietal junction, anterior medial, prefrontal cortex, premotor cortex, posterior cingulate cortex, and pregenual anterior cingulate cortex. So this complicated large scale network is our self network. What is not included in this network yet, but has a place, hippocampus, hypothalamus, parts of cerebellum, and parts of brainstem, which are now getting investigated and discovered from 2020 to 2024. So we have now understood that this is how we process the value, process the self. Now we come to how we execute, it, execute this. So now we go from value processing to execution. When you grow from normal to abnormal expression of a normative animal trait, like preference or balance, blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol level, and every available human normative biomarkers of control of expression of that trait becomes paramount importance. Because that is another area of dysfunction and that is the most common area of dysfunction, actually, not only another area of dysfunction. Yes, our idea and network of self is abnormal in so-called delusion, but our executive control and how we execute it is more common area of dysfunction than our self-processing network. This control control in brain is provided by three networks of brain, executive control system, extended reward system or motivational network, inhibitory control network, which prevents us from giving a value-based response. So we are now in that conundrum of executive network about which I have talked before multiple times. Because the thing is, in brain, no research is done by psychiatrists. Very few neurologists go into brain research. So the brain research is done by mostly some neuroradiologists. And other than that, all the non-medical people, non-clinical people. So they see brain in a form of blind man assessing an elephant. So they defound multiple names for a group of large scale brain network that is doing the executive work. So what are the multiple names? Central executive network, Cognitive control network, dorsal attentional network, executive control network, executive network, frontoparietal network, working memory network, tax positive network, ventral attentional network. Must be the executive function must be some of them or a combination of all of them, right? So we have to solve this conundrum, which is our next task. 
these are the topographical map of some of this network you see there is gross overlap gross gross overlap not only gross very gross overlap so we should go into various spatial topography of distinct network and ultimately we have to do a network analysis and that gave us four separable network clusters and the separable network clusters are front operator network executive control network dorsal attentional network and tax positive network none of the other label have been found to significantly contribute to any of the four clusters so these four separable network clusters are there which control the executive network so it is a combination of front operator network executive control network dorsal attentional network and tax positive network so this is the executive function the network of executive function is a combination of these brain areas you see this is a massive area it combines almost all brain areas that we talk about so now comes the motivational framework basic reward system or motivational system because that becomes part of the reason why we do something so extended brain reward system or motivational circuit why i am talking about extended brain reward system because reward circuit is just part of circuit that's part of the puzzle reward circuit has multiple inputs from various areas of brain and all of these contribute to function of reward circuit which it is known as motivational areas so the areas would be dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex orbital prefrontal cortex temporal pole hippocampus anterior insula ventromedial prefrontal cortex anterior thalamus amygdala nucleus accumbens all of these combine to form the large scale cortical network known as extended brain reward system which is responsible for any animal behavior which happens in response to any external or internal cues so now we come to the inhibitory control networks the brakes for brain and the most ill defined of this three network it gives these all functions inhibition it is up it is causing inhibition it is causing shifting or cognitive flexibility it is causing updating of working updating memory or working memory and they combine to form planning they combine to form self monitoring and they combine to form attentional and cognitive control the network of inhibitory control starts from cerebellum cerebellum is the major center for all inhibitory control and that is why cerebellum forms the brake of brain which is relaxed slowly to gain to give brain acceleration in momentum in some work or which is not relaxed at all to give brain some stopping power
so this is the basic neuroscience of executive control i have given you a very schematic bird side view because that saying more would be making you disoriented but now you have some idea that this is how things are working with when it that is physiology we have a sense of self a sense of executive executive control a sense of motivation a sense of inhibitory control and based on that we go on to the cognitive bias that is known as value uh, added preference or choice or other thing so when there is pathology how many ways that can happen either the individual components of value processing systems are malfunctioning and attaching more value to autobiographical processes disregarding environmental sensory input or the executive control or its components are malfunctioning and the person is acting up under the influence of improper value processing so either value processing system is gone or executive control is gone and if the person is specifically unfortunate then both are gone this starts the fixed from belief that is not amenable to any logic and person start acting on them so this is delusion a normative phenomena which becomes abnormal when our value processing system goes into hyperdrive and makes values more important than they really are or the executive control system loses its balance and motivational process go unhindered and classes with value processing system to make something appear more important than it is so this opened up the gates to the sigen pathology also known as hallucination delusion is the basis of hallucination hallucination cannot happen without delusion so what other brain processes got added to delusional circuits or circuits of delusion to cause hallucination sensory discrimination and processing or integration function processes as well as three dimensional placement of an animal in respect to its internal and external environment the sensory discrimination process this is a central and peripheral nervous system network process that help an individual to apprise and discriminate different sensory input based on quality of sensory information intensity of sensory information duration and interval of sensory information direction of sensory information for example i am hearing a sound i would discriminate between two uh, different sound based on whether one is having different quality from other or not whether one is more loud than other or not whether one is more prolonged or less prolonged whether one has intermittent intervals or no intervals or from where the sound is coming so what is the network of sensory discrimination it is the network that combines brain stem insula and prefrontal cortex and 
with various input from hippocampus, thalamus, reticular ascending system, cerebellum, and other areas. So what are the sensory perceptions that are perceived by us? Long range sensory perception, that is visual and auditory, short range and immediate range sensory perception, smell, touch, taste, proprioception, and spatial perception. Spatial perception is not yet firmly included into sensory perception, but it should be included because it has a remarkable contribution to various kind of imagery disturbances, also known as hallucination. So we are talking about sensory discrimination. So what sensory perception needs rigorous sensory discrimination? Long range sensory perception as they are helping in predator vigilance. Yes, we don't need predator vigilance at this moment, but predator vigilance is one of the uh, actually reason for which long range sensory perceptions has started in animals. Then accurate placement of individual in surrounding environments, navigate through external environment, interaction with external environment, and observe, receive, and respond to social layer of external environment, for which we need this long range sensory perception. So if these two are long range sensory perception, which of these would be more prone to failure of sensory discrimination? It is always auditory because auditory is a single quality sensation. Whereas vision has multiple qualities ingrained in it. Auditory is only sound. Some pitch, some cadence, so that is that is all, nothing more. In vision, color, depth, hue, the various things are there to define a visual perception. Then auditory is a very time sensitive sensation. It doesn't last. Any visual sensation actually keep a lasting impression in our macula. And so we can recall visual memories and visual stimulation better. Very less check and balance system in auditory pathways from peripheral to central nervous system. Only external layer, internal layer, then third nerve, then geniculate bodies, then directly auditory processing in temporal areas. Not much complexity, not much change of balance. And so it is very simplistic. So the chances of errors are always much more. The most, that is why the most common type of sensory discrimination failure is auditory failure. And that is why most commonly encountered hallucinations are auditory. Due to highly developed auditory process and very high auditory integration, congenitally blind people have very good sensory discrimination in their brain. That makes them less susceptible to auditory discrimination failure and gave rise to the prevailing meat Congenital blindness is protective against psychosis. All of the PGTs in their first year have been asked, all if not, uh, mostly all. I remember I have faced this trick question. I don't know how many of you have faced, but in my understanding, most of the PGTs have faced this trick question. 
which is protective against psychosis. And we had to talk about congenital blindness. And then a lot of importance was given to light and absence of light and things like that. But it is actually not that. It is due to that highly developed uh, congenital blind has highly developed auditory processes. And in them, the only long range sensory stimulus is auditory. So it is as complex as visual cortex, visual sensation for them. And they, if you go into more, go more into research of auditory perception in this congenital blind, you would find that in them, auditory perception and auditory perceptual uh, processing takes the place of visual perception in them. And it, exp it is expanded in their area. It is one of the example of neuroplasticity. And so they have such an evolved auditory process that it is very hard to fool this auditory process. And that is why it is hard or next to impossible for them to have auditory hallucination. So many of you, I don't know how many are listening to this complex talk. I don't expect many to hear this. Anyway, if this is uploaded in YouTube. I hope many in future would see it. If you are listening to it, you would have a question. Why short range perceptions or short range sensory perceptions are excluded from my description? Because they are always prone to errors. Touch sensation. You can fool tarsus and very easily. It is almost very easy to fool tars transition. You can do various experiments on touch, proprioception, smell, and taste. And you would find they are very, very erroneous. In fact, it is so erroneous that their hallucinations and delusions, sorry, their hallucinations or their perceptual abnormalities are not even listed usually. But formication, the sense of bugs crawling on skin is widely documented in psychiatric literature, although it has given a name of delusional parasitosis, which has no meaning at all because it is also seen in cocaine and cocaine addiction and cocaine withdrawal and uh, are called cocaine, ma cocaine bugs or methamphetamine mites because the generation is same. The perceptual aberration in skin and in cocaine mite, in cocaine bug or meth mite, we give autonomic nervous system blocker and we give antidepressant and in formications of old age, we name it delusional parasitosis and delusional parasitosis and zombify those persons with antipsychotic, which is a criminal offense actually. But our teaching is like that. Similarly, Many patients of anxiety and many patients of depression complain about persistent reeling with negative caloric taste, negative taste in any vestibular area. They are actually reporting hallucination of proprioception, which is coming as vertigo because in severe anxiety, perceptual abnormalities frequently happen in proprioception. So if you know how to look for them, you would find out. But in psychiatry teaching, it is all about 
making the critical reasoning die in student and make them only non medical psychologists so they are not giving importance these type of thinking are not giving important so if we talk about sensory integration function and networks for it then it is a whole brain function and so far there are areas of interact but not a single definitive network it is a multi level multi node interactive process where single sensory modalities are mixed matched with brain learnings of previous time and cognitive biases and process to form a accurate representation of three dimensional spatial orientation of an individual in their environment that is why spatial processing should be a special sense anyway so the schematic view areas of interest in sensory integration from cerebellum thalamus hippocampus paramotor area premotor area posterior cortex posterior parietal cortex vestibular input comes visual input comes proprioceptive input comes motor efference copy comes and these are the outputs other important hope nodes and hubs of this huge brain wide network thalamus basal ganglia temporal cortex various other areas of neocortex ultimately it is the whole of neocortex and its interaction with subcortical structure which create the basis of multimodal sensory processing and integration to create the complete three dimensional spatial imagery inside animal brain that gives an animal complete understanding of its place in its environment so the final view and with this last piece of basic understanding i hope i have done away with icd and dsm forever for my audience this picture remember this picture sensory integration is in adhd ocd oppositional defined disorder specific learning disorder autism spectrum disorder anxiety to rate developmental coordination disorder in gifted to it is occurring attention deficit disorder it is occurring depression everything psycho is everything everything is sensory integration disorder if you think about it now i have talked about a lot about a very complex thing so i should give you some schematics of these processes integrating them and creating the schematic pathophysiology of delusion and hallucination and then i would jump into other thing so there would be increased autobiographical process which normally would lead to rumination and obsession there would be increased motivational or reward circuit tone which would lead to compulsive and impulsive behavior normally which would be decreased inhibitory control and decreased executive function Which should lead to attention deficit trait and addiction to process and substances, but all three of them would at times combine and form fixed firm belief, not amenable to logical reasoning, a car delusion. And this is the flow chart of hallucination formation. All delusion forming machinery. last disturbed sensory discrimination network last disturbed sensory integration network resulting in disturbed spatial perception and spatial orientation resulting in hallucinations of all sensory modalities although auditory is the primary disturbance so this is the connectomic based formulation of delusion and hallucination and 
this is the thing you should first understand then what are the molecular mechanisms for it actually there are millions of causes and trillions of complex combination of these causes which can give rise to this type of network disturbances the cluck tracks of molecular mechanism would be heightened neural glial and immune system cell hyperexcitability and the hyperexcitability would then translate into individual or group of neural network deviant functioning depending on how and where the hyperexcitability is causing malformation and ultimately the disturbance would become first physiological then enhanced physiological then ultimately pathological and the basic schema this basic flow chart would come so any any network that is included here if they are disturbed then this thing would occur if any network that are included in these areas then this thing would occur and you already know from my presentation that most of the brain areas are problem so standing there we now are going into basic understanding of neural excitability may i interrupt you bhaskar yes we just want to understand how much more would this take uh just a minute let me see this is actually three more slides okay fine carry on hmm. because i am not going into deep of molecular neuroscience yet <laughs> if i talk about molecular neuroscience of positive symptoms today all would quit and take rest from all future session anyway cellular stress sensing cellular stress happens when there is increased homeostatic load to brain high information carrying load to brain and ultimately there would be high hyperactivity of brain areas handling the load this causes increase cellular protein recycling increase mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation increase redox stress and cellular stress and increase ear stress response that causes ultimately cellular stress sensing by nlr that is not like receptor pathway and dmp pathway activation then that would cause microglial activation microglial astrocyte co corresponding activation and disinhibition when there is microglial activation astrocyte is also activated but when astrocyte is activated it tries to stop activation of microglia then there is ld activation of nlrp3 intermesome and neurovascular coupling then there are various way the synergogenesis occurs and this lead to various other i am not going into more details today but then the next episode would be talking about positive symptom and it is treatment is close up in gold standard metabolic syndrome catatonia treatment resistant schizophrenia and many things so next episode would be talks on how we translate this basic understanding of positive symptom into treatment and what to do what not to do. i hope i have not really caused this function of your brain circuits today i'm sure baskar you have definitely tickled us uh, may i call upon malay to just take over the chat box and look at the questions uh thank you baskar for a nice uh, uh basic talk on uh, the uh, brain circuits and brain function uh when it comes to the positive and negative symptoms so thank you for not only uh, positive not only not negative only positive 
Yeah. So, uh, so we are, you know, kind of uh, laying down a proper grounding for what's going to come next. So there are a certain points that people have raised and some questions. So I'll start. Uh, Dr. Prashant yes. Chaudhary says that one of my teachers described a phenomenon called psychotic somatization and used to ask us to use low-dose antipsychotics with tricyclics for the same. I think uh, we'll leave this, uh, I mean, of course, uh, as we proceed ahead in this series, we'll be discussing more of uh, this kind of uh, uh, presentations and hmm. what, what we'll be doing about it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, a question, uh, yeah. You're saying something? The, qu the question, wh what is the question? It's, it's a comment. So it's hmm. it's more about how you would approach uh, uh, the somatic symptoms that you mentioned in a patient yes. who is psychotic. So Obviously, yeah. somatic uh, symptom and psychosis is part of the whole thing. Please proceed. Please proceed, yeah. boss. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jamal Tariq... Uh, uh asks a question so uh hmm. it means does it mean that compulsions or addictions are behavioral variants of delusion kind of <laughs> you can say that okay uh okay uh yes uh dr tirthankar das gupta asks a very basic question uh when we talk of this valence so how does this valence develop first for the very first time in a human being some, some or rather I would say, I cannot say the percentage. The percentage value I am mentioning is mostly arbitrary. But about 50% or more of it is congenital. We are born with a balance system. Our brain is primed to like something, to dislike something, to feel at home at some areas, to feel alienated at some areas. So a large part of it, it is innate. The rest part, which is almost 50% again, would be learning. Our lifelong learning of different environment, matching our basic inclination with our learning and that creates the final of our value system. Okay. And uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Nachiketa asks, would it be okay to say that conceptual processing is affected more in uh, the pathophysiology of delusion, whereas perceptual processing more in hallucinations? I think you did uh, uh, give us some details about that, but still, if you'd like hmm. to summarize. Yes, conceptual, I would not say that this is more, this is less. Because you see, hallucination is the next step of delusion. Some people do not go to the next step. Some people stay in delusional phase. Some people go into the next step. So depending on various things that happens, in some, the conceptual processing is much stronger and in them it is hard for them to let go of that and go into delusion so go into hallucination maybe number two is sensory processing disturbance may not be that strong and they don't go into hallucination so delusion versus hallucination is not the way Delusion leading to hallucination is the way. Okay, fine. Uh, okay, I'll. Doctor Usman Hotiana has got uh, uh, a point. Uh, a blind person might be. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, the blindness in a blind person might be advantageous uh, as seen in excellent singers who are blind. So, is it an evolutional age or what are your comments on that? Would you like to comment? Means the voice... Means, yeah, the people who are blind are better singers or are excellent singers. Maybe their visual processing is gone. So, their auditory processing is much more. So, they can analyze tonal variant better. 
but whether that is giving them an edge in vocal processing that has not yet been studied so my answer would be maybe yes but we don't have proof yet so it would be just an hypothesis at this moment dr okay. malay usman also has one more observation before that yes so his observation is again uh, when we were discussing about the uh, uh, delusion and hallucination as being one being because of a conceptual processing issue and percept and uh, hallucinations being a perceptual processing issue dr uh, hotian had commented at that time so i was coming to that uh, was whether in love at first sight uh, is a perceptual processing at fault or a conceptual one uh it is love as first sight is not considered pathological so mm -hmm. if we consider pathology then we would only say whether there is something at fault or not this is the actual answer but if you consider love at first sight is a conceptual or perceptual abnormality i would say it is more of a matching of innate something strongly our innate something strongly with someone else's innate something only innate something would give that much emotional arousal but what innate something is that that i don't know okay uh uh doctor uh... Sharik Kureshi has asked, uh, uh, "Which are the books that you have taken the pictures from?" Mm, and, I have given and, the and, references. And, okay, and also he uh, he makes a point. Uh, you can uh, you know uh, comment on it. Uh, uh, whatever you said about uh, hallucinations, basically. uh the the visual perception or the visual processing has many many components as compared to the uh, auditory processing and so auditory processing uh, because of its very nature uh you know can be uh, uh the, at the basis of uh, hallucinations so does this also explain why visual has hallucinations are suggestive more suggestive of an organic lesion mm, organic lesion is a bad name ideally i would say visual hallucination are more suggestive of a brain wide large scale dysfunction because okay. until and unless there is a large scale dysfunction this very tight check and balance system cannot go into disarray and form visual hallucination so yes you are right but do not call it organic cause rather call it large scale brain dysfunction large scale macroscopic brain dysfunction whatever name you like but please do not call it organic that suggest other things are not organic yes uh dr prashant choudhary asks one more question any rule uh, any role of use of language making our brain more prone to error in perception as loosely stated in the sapphire wharf hypothesis the question is language processing has a role in our perception that i know that i know sorry that we know the uh, our fast language that we acquire gives us the way we process our visual information the way we direct our visual information process but there is no proof yet that it affects our auditory learning or that it affects our auditory processing the same way so i cannot comment at this stage whether there is any role or not because we simply don't have that much data yet okay uh dr mangla divay mangla asks uh, 
uh, when thoughts automatically arise in the brain, is it an automatic process like the SA node in the heart? Thought, thought automatically doesn't arise in the brain. The, what happens is brain is an electrical organ. So there is continuous excitatory uh, uh, postsynaptic potential, inhibitory presynaptic potential. They are always happening. When some of them coalesce, there is a thought. When some of them coalesce more, the thought goes into action. Or when there is a need of them to coalesce more, then there is an action. But that doesn't mean brain do doesn't produce spontaneous activity. Brain produces spontaneous activity. Brain actually has so far known 33 pacemaker. I don't know how many pacemaker ultimately we would land up in. Heart has one maximum two pacemaker, brain already known 33 pacemakers. So brain has spontaneous activity, but thought is does not is not produced by that. Yeah, so I, I would just like to make a point here that uh, Bhaskar at the beginning and many times during the course of his talk has uh, made it very clear that, you know, uh, this whole uh, dysfunction or the pathophysiology behind these symptoms is not very simple, straightforward, linear. And there are many components involved. We have understood, you know, we have, as he, as he showed in his uh, presentation, that there was some understanding, let's say, 10 years back. And over the last 10 years, we have so much more to know. But that's not the end of it. So there will be more things coming up. We'll know better. So uh, we, we need not jump to conclusions that this exactly. is it and uh, this is not it. Uh, it can also happen. Uh, now, for example, again, Pascal mentioned uh, in the first uh, decade of uh, 21st century, uh, the circuits look pretty simple, straightforward with few components. But as we understood better, as our tools uh, improved, now we will find cerebellum getting involved somewhere or the other, brainstem areas getting uh, involved in most of the circuits and most of the processing, which uh, in the last century for us who have uh, tried to understand uh, the uh, neurosciences had no clue about such things so you know just just hang on this these things are you know uh, uh, in the making we are not we do not have complete knowledge as yet and so it would be very difficult to understand uh, things more than what we know of actually so uh, another question that comes uh, to you is uh, Many times there are only hallucinations, but no delusions. Any reason for that or any explanation for that? Many times there are hallucinations, no delusions. Example. Example not given. So the, 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 thing, is, the thing is, is it possible? So if you can just tell us in brief. Without any actually background, predisposition of brain to give one view much more importance than other perceptual disturbance of hallucination cannot occur. So the patient might or might not develop that kind of delusion that used are usually associated with. For example, you think paranoia is a, uh, it's a delusion, but you don't think a person fighting and killing another person because of dissimilar football club liking is a delusion. You don't think that a person who is so much into nationalism that he or she is cheering death of, of citizens of another country is delusional. So if you think if from this perspective, you would find out that the person whom you are stamping as a patient with no delusion, but only hallucination has this type of tendencies in their life. Okay, just, just to uh, 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 make that point, uh, the question that you asked, an example he has given, Dr. Mangla has given an example 
uh, alcoholic hallucinations are pure hallucinations without any delusion uh, dr jadeja has added to that what about hallucin hallucinogen induced hallucinations so basic point is uh, hallucinations <laughs> without delusion those who are taking alcohol they are doing already a biased activity they are giving hallucin who are developing alcoholic hallucinations those who already have a brain which gives one substance importance to everything in exclusion of everything else they already actually <laughs> give them satisfied criteria of hallucination delusion so based on that the hallucination is occurring now the hallucination of hallucinogenic induced hallucination hallucinogenic induced hallucination is not true hallucination it is not hallucination uh, hallucinogen induced hallucination is more like perceptual disturbances they are not hallucinations because they are not going to stay they are just bursts of different color which colors are happening due to excited brain discharge of different neuronal circuits and those circuits are producing colors in front of the eye so again the here application of the name hallucination is a misnomer rather than hallucination appearing, appearing without delusion okay so i'll take last two questions because uh, we are running short of time uh, dr arman mehru uh, uh, has a question uh, we are taught as pgs that about secondary delusions that is delusions that developed in an attempt to explain hallucinations uh, there is uh, wait, 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 wait let me finish the question you have said that the reverse is actually the case hmm. so are secondary delusions a different phenomenon or do you think our concept of delusions and hallucinations need to be revised obviously it needs to be revised if you understand that what is hallucination pathway what is delusions pathway then primary de hallucination secondary hallucination primary delusion secondary del delusion do they really exist it is time to forget seems and face and all the psychopathology book there is no psycho there is no uh, psyche there is no mind the things are happening in the brain so they have seems and fees are from that era where they have done beautiful observations but after observation they have given those observations explanation based on old understanding that has no relevance today so take the observation i am not saying do not read or read seems or fees i i would rather say read fees read seem to understand the descriptive phenomenology but please please don't go into explanation of them because the explanation is outdated wrong unscientific and based on psychology rather than true neuroscience okay uh last question uh, last question here and uh, one uh, another question after that uh, dr paresh asks uh, dr baskar what is the take home message for private psychiatrists the take home pure take home private message uh, would come next session i would give you treatment for delusion which is not antipsychotic i would give you treatment for hallucination which is not antipsychotic i would give you treatment for all those things where you don't need antipsychotic rather than something else but from today's session the past message that private psychiatrists needs to understand is this insistence on proving whether it is a primary hallucination or secondary hallucination whether it is a primary delusion or secondary delusion trying to exhibit this seems trying to exhibit this fees in a patient is a futile pointless exercise it's based to include what kind of hallucination and delusion a person has and then try to 
understand from brain point of view what is the dysfunctional process and direct treatment towards it rather than going into details of fees seems another thing primary delusion secondary delusion primary delusion secondary hallucination autochthonous hallucination very beautiful name to say nil meaning at this moment and nil mean meaning for psychiatry and science okay uh, the last uh, question is by dr nirmala shrinivasan uh, she has uh, put in a question in your mailbox directly so i think uh, you will need to get back to her uh, we'll uh, sure not, sure not not discuss sure. it here uh, sure thank that, you because thank you because if you had not done so i would have uh, missed my train so thank you <laughs> yeah, okay and uh, thank you so much uh, bhaskar for having uh, given us so much uh, 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 information and knowledge of value uh, we are looking forward to the next sec- uh, next session on psychosis two weeks hence Uh, and with that uh, i hand over the proceedings to dr rajkumar sir yeah thank you dr malai thank you dr baskar it was a lively session and, and hope... i i request everyone please copy your uh, uh, questions please uh, copy all the questions in the chat box because i have not been able to answer all of them please make a list and send them to me i i would answer each of you what you asked problem is today i am in a rush and i would miss my train if i don't stop now so mm-hmm. but the session doesn't end here just send me the questions in my whatsapp number all of you have my whatsapp number just send it to my whatsapp number if you want to my mail and i would answer i have also put the official mail of the brain on wednesdays brain on wednesdays at gmail.com your feedbacks your questions can be put on to that also so that we can improve as well as enhance our learning process thank you very much dr baskar and uh, dr malai good night to all of you friends good night we meet next on the 23rd of january and at last Well, to last and uh, lastly answer the comment neuroscience hasn't hijacked the psychology psychology is trying to hijack cognitive neuroscience but psychology is actually a dead subject we thank the neuroscience division of alchem laboratories for the logistics good night to all of you good night bye bye good night bye